Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Again, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Bromley's going to say more about this later. Humor is something that is deeply embedded in particular cultures, and thus different things strike people as humorous in different cultures. One thing our culture shares with cultures of the Bible is that human humor is often found in making fun of powerful people who show an utter lack of humility. There is a particularly poignant ex instance of this in Luke 22, when Jesus basically encourages a little humility in the disciples, while also making fun of kings far and wide. Absurdly, this scene takes place in the upper room, right after Jesus has had the Last Supper with his disciples. From the Gospel of Luke. Then the apostles got into an argument about which one of them was the greatest. So Jesus told them, kings near and far order their people around, and powerful rulers everywhere insist on being called benefactors. But don't be like them. The most important one of you should, by, should be like the least important, and your leader should be like a servant. Who do people think is the greatest? A person who is served or the one who does the serving? It's the one who is served, right? But I have been with you as one who does the serving. Thanks be to God for these words of life. There's a bit after that where um, the actor who plays Mr. Deity uh, says that scene just about killed Sean, who's the guy who plays the boy. Getting that all out uh, was hard. But I think we're going to just adopt that now as our lesson plan for confirmation when we do the Trinity. And I think that will be fine. I think that will help. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth not totally bomb, O oh God, who knows the proclaimers of your gospel generally make really lousy comedians. Amen. Earlier in the week, I bemoaned to two pastoral colleagues my attempts to write a sermon for this Holy Humor Sunday. I am supposed to be funny, I lamented. Though, okay, this is not actually strictly true. I whined to far more than two colleagues and friends this week. Upwards of four, maybe six, and also my husband and my mother. Whenever Mike would stop by my open office door to see how things were coming and to offer assistance, I'd bristle. No, I'm fine, I deadpan. I'm very funny. I had written it to my two colleagues about something else, something serious, and closed with my lament about humor. Being funny is the worst, one commiserated. Why is God funny, another asked. And in that moment in my whining, I paused. There is certainly a long history in Christianity and elsewhere that stresses that important things must be taken seriously that solemnity is due to the sacred. As soon as we step off course, we risk blasphemy. I tried real hard with the call to worship, knowing it wouldn't actually be funny, but at least hoping I could get away without, you know, committing blasphemy. And then Grant calls me out before we're even done with the prayer. It is hard to be funny in church. One ancient Buddhist text wonders, how can anyone laugh who knows of old age, disease, and death? I was working on my sermon yesterday when we started to hear news of the gun violence 
the attack at the synagogue in California as worshipers gathered on the last day of Passover. How can anyone laugh? Who knows of old age, disease, and death? On laughter, playwright Bertolt Brecht once wrote, he who laughs has not yet heard the bad news. We have heard the bad news, we know it. Cultures from ancient to modern have had jesters, comedians, fools, but the roles those actors played has varied across societies. Yesterday, I got comedy tonight from a funny thing happened on the way to the forum stuck in my head, and I went hunting for the lyrics. Did you ever see that? Do you know that song? It's so fun, right? Nothing with kings, nothing with crowns. Bring on the lovers, liars, and clowns. Nothing with gods, nothing with fate. Weighty affairs will just have to wait. That sort of humor, that sort of comedy sets aside, it claims, anything that is worth considering too deeply. It is playful and raucous, joyful and fun. It is not really the stuff of faith. I watched the movie trailer with Fiona, our 11-year-old, by my side. Her responses were perfect. This looks kind of inappropriate. Why are those men dressed in women's clothes? <laughs> the story is a farce. It is bawdy and silly and feels a bit like a Mel Brooks film but with music by Stephen Sondheim. And yet, even then, it's set in motion by a serious matter. The protagonist and narrator, Sedulus, uh, a pseudolus, pardon me, a slave in the house of Senex who is seeking to buy his freedom. Men and women are bought and sold, and love and happiness must find their way amidst the constraints of society. There are different forms of comedy, and each of us have those that we like best. My paternal grandfather was a punster, and we sent, spent our lives with him both groaning and marveling over his turns of phrase. My maternal grandfather, I have never heard laugh so loud as when we saw the original Naked Gun movie, which is both slapstick and totally naughty, and, uh, and he just lost it. And I was like, oh, I know something new about you. There are scholars of comedy, and they note a number of different categories of humor. Humor about oppression, from the position of the oppressed or marginalized. That's the kind that we hear in Jesus poking fun at those who call themselves benefactors. Satirical humor, highbrow wit and wordplay, Theological or philosophical humor, like that. Comedy about disguise and mistaken identities. Why are those guys in women's clothes? Comedy about bodies and sex. Comedy about bodily function. Comedy that is just ridiculously silly. I learned about classical theater from my mother. Uh, um, <laughs> I wrote down the name of this Greek playwright and now I'm having this like total pronunciation gaffe and so I'm like not even going to say it. But he wrote Lysistrata and a number of other comedies and Voltaire and Shakespeare and Wilde. My mother retires this year and has staged all those works and more. Each of those shows has wordplay and highbrow wit, political humor and satire and sarcasm and scatological humor as well. We may often miss it because we don't understand the language or the context. Fiona's reading uh, Romeo and Juliet in her language arts class and I was thinking back and I am delighted that she probably won't get most of the humor because the first couple of scenes are just all jokes about like virginity. I'm like not really ready to have that conversation. We have to learn in those works that something is a joke from the footnotes, and as another scholar notes, a joke explained is not a joke that amuses. 
We also miss humor sometimes because it has been deliberately wiped away, buried or hidden. There is a sense that uh, Indian culture and Hindu Indian culture in particular is not funny. And there are reasons for those uh, suppositions that scholars will argue, but one uh, example clearly demonstrates that part of the problem is in the translation. The story is told, for example, of one of the gods who has been with his lover and afterward in the dark scrambles to find their clothes. As the lights go on, it is revealed that they are in one another's clothes. They have mixed them up. It's the danger of getting dressed in the dark and getting caught and all the things. And yet, when people, the faithful, have interpreted this text over time, they have seen this moment, this comedy of error, this comedy of circumstance, of silliness, as one in which, well, this is actually an allegory about how they are united together and now they share this wonderful, it's like, no, no, no. This is about getting caught after getting dressed in the dark. We miss the joke because we theologize, we allegorize, we do these things somehow, perhaps to sanitize these stories, the humor in our faith traditions. I wonder if this is because we are somehow threatened by the truths revealed by humor. That sex is sometimes playful, that the powerful are not always just, that God doesn't always know exactly how it works and we have to take this on mystery. Or maybe that God is the only one who understands and our systems of trying to make sense out of these mysteries venture in to the absurd. I was trying to reflect on the kinds of bits, the pieces that just make those in our family absolutely lose our minds with laughter. And none of them are going to be shared with you from this pulpit. <laughs> One, my grandpa with the naked gun. I can remember so clearly. I didn't even get it at the time. My mother, my mother who is so cultured. If you ever want to lose, see her just lose it. You show her this one scene from Austin Powers. <laughs> Highbrow comedy. Highbrow. Josh and I watched an SNL skit done. It was a, like a weekend update appearance by Kate McKinnon once. We're sitting in bed just watching the clip on our laptops. We can't even make it through like a whole SNL. You know, we just only are watching this one. And it was, we were, you know, literally gonna fall on the floor, couldn't catch our breaths. Finally, we get it. 20 minutes later, we like, you know, just say one phrase again and have lost it all over again. Bodies are holy and gross and silly. Comparisons are funny but not appropriate for worship. Maybe this tells us less about ourselves, what we think is funny and our ridiculous senses of humor, and more about the ways that we construct our worship, what we believe is true about God. I took the sermon title, A Sudden Glory, from a quote from Thomas Hobbes, you know, that political philosopher. And he notes that laughter is the sudden glory that appears, is manifest when both we see something terrible happen to someone else or some fault in another, or we remember some fault from our own past that we can now laugh at. It's the kind of mean-spirited humor. I love the idea of a sudden glory, but I don't think he quite captures it in his description. Then again, this is also the man who described human life as nasty, brutish, and short. He was not someone who necessarily enjoyed life all that much, I imagine. 
Still, I love this language of laughter as sudden glory. Thinks it captures, think it captures the wonder of laughing, of laughing, of joyfully seeing something in new ways. Laughter comes, the best humor comes from particular descriptions, accurate descriptions of somehow universal or shared experiences. Laughter comes from the absurd way of seeing truth in a new way. I had the privilege of interviewing um, Daniel Mallory Ortberg, who was at that time one of the founder and editors of The Toast, which is like was the best uh, humor site for a number of years and ceased publishing a couple of years ago. I think in 2016. And uh, one of the reasons that they did so was because uh, Daniel in particular had uh, three deadlines a day. Every day, every day wrote three funny things. That is astounding to me. I wanted to uh, title the interview for an article like America's Funniest Christian. One of the things that I loved about the toast and which so many of my clergy colleagues loved about the toast was because it wasn't really mean-spirited. It always followed the rule of good comedy of punching up. The idea, of course, is that you can't punch down. You can't like make a joke or make fun of or ridicule someone who has less power or status than you. That's not funny, that's bullying, right? That's not good Christian comedy. However, you can punch up. You can shine at the light of truth. You can uh, accurately ridicule and shine that light of truth on those who have more power or status than you. They were also, at the toast, always abundantly silly. Ortberg would uh, run, <laughs> Ortberg was like an art history and literature major uh, in college and would just have a lot of medieval paintings and texts and then had this series called Two Monks. It would be like two monks invent, uh, um, you know, invent uh, Bible iconography. And they'd show mid med medieval icons from biblical texts like the Tower of Babel. And they'd be like, so how high do you think is the Tower of Babel? And be like, well, remember, it's the sign of human hubris and trying to reach all the way up to the sky, up to God in the heavens, so probably like at least a story and a half tall. And they'd show this picture, you know, and like, and the perspective is all goofy because like people are still learning art. And, uh, you know, so half the people are as tall as the building and then the heaven. I feel like that was the ultimate punching up because one, like everyone you're making fun of is long dead and two, you're just making fun of the fact that like Western art hadn't figured out how to draw people yet. It was wonderful <laughs> and we miss it every day. It is hard to find Christian humor. I spent the week reading and watching a lot of YouTube videos trying to find something that we could show in worship. And there is funny stuff about the church. There is funny stuff about God, about us, about the human condition. But often it pokes at our somewhat delicate sensibilities. Somehow we feel that this stuff of life is not appropriate for worship that it might offend God. We forget, of course, that God created the platypus, as we noted, and the human excretory system. Things that masquerade as Christian humor didn't fit either. Sometimes they forget about punching up and punching down. There's one Christian humor site that has come about in the last couple of years called the Babylon Bee. And the Babylon Bee has some funny things, making fun of praise band leaders and making fun of 
uh, evangelical mega church culture, and sometimes people share it. But the Babylon Bee has also published incredibly mean-spirited pieces written about uh, just reinforcing stereotypes about women who have to go to Planned Parenthood for health care, or George Soros, which in a time when, again, Christians should be particularly mindful of the ways in which anti-Semitism functions and leads to violence in the world, we should not be joking about such things. I asked Ortberg what makes a good joke. How do you come up with all of these things? He said, it's not just punching up or punching down. That can't be the only criteria. Some others are this. One, do I think it's funny? Two, is it overdone? Is there some new angle that can be mined? Is there some new way of shedding light? Is there some new truth to be revealed? Basically, is there a joke there that hasn't been beaten to death? A lot of humor, Ortberg noted, is death denying, not good humor. Humor that wants to be clean, to deny the messiness of life, to suggest that if we just play it by the rules, and have the same comic about Noah and the ark over and over again, that somehow we will be doing right by God. That if we can avoid blasphemy, if we can avoid perhaps angering the powerful, we can deny that death has power, that we do not have power. We laugh because there's nothing else we can do. The New York Times ran a great review of a new book on Jewish humor that, uh, that did a typology of these things, of the different kinds of comedy, all the way from the Hebrew Bible and uh, the Midrash and then into, you know, up to Larry David and girls. But said that one of the things